afternoon, everyone. May I ask those uh, who are standing to take your seats, please? There are no uh, assigned seats, so welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. I'm Bruna Santos, incoming director for the Brazil Institute. And I'm really happy to welcome uh, you all for this first uh, in-person event at the Brazil Institute after almost three months working via Zoom and having hosting a number of events online. I'm really glad to see this room uh, with people, with friends, long-term friends of the Brazil Institute and the Walter Wilson Center. I also want to let you know that the event's been streamed so people can watch us. It's on our uh, page, Brazil Institute. And um, feel free to share this, the, the link to join, ask people in Brazil to join this conversation. This is uh, Brazil-US Climate Dialogue and Research and Scientific Cooperation between Brazil and the United States. It's one of a series of uh, dialogues and with it's been held in partnership with FAPESP, the Research Foundation in Brazil, who, uh, which has been a long-term partner of the Brazil Institute and the World Wilson Center, starting in 2011 when Paulo Sotero uh, worked on a collaboration uh, where they hosted uh, 16, am I right, Paulo? 16 FAPESP weeks and have done a number of other symposiums and so on. For those who uh, don't know, uh, I think that FAPESP is, in my opinion, a world-class institution in Brazil that definitely is a precious institution for the Brazilian state and is a key part of Brazil uh, innovation and, sustain and also sustainability strategy to position the country in terms of innovation and progress. In today's event, we will feature a collaborative research between Brazil and the United States uh, regarding the Amazon region, regarding sustainability, climate action, and preservation and recovery of biodiversity in the country. In 2001, FAPESP brought together, uh, along with other research foundations in Brazil, throughout Brazil, other 20 research foundations, a fund called Amazon Plus 10, which I just learned now that became Amazon Plus 20, in an effort to bring together different uh, research foundations to work on um, research, applied research, and new uh, ideas and technologies for the region of the Amazon. Well, we believe here at the Brazil Institute that Brazil is definitely in a very unique uh, place to uh, leverage its abundant natural resources and clean energy to be, to be uh, a green power in the world. And I do believe that we are now starting. It's the another another. Uh, point of this great partnership between the Brazil Institute and FAPESP and other uh, institutions to have this long-term view uh, done. So um, no more um, waiting. So I want to introduce you our great panelists in this conversation today. Marco Antonio Zago, president of FAPESP. Uh, we also have here with us Anderson Correa, who is the provost of ITA, the Aeronautics Institute of Technology in Brazil. Carlos Carlotti, provost of the University of Sao Paulo, welcome. Luis Valcov Loreiro, who is the executive director for Fulbright Commission Brazil. Jeffrey Ho, who is an associate professor of anthropology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and co-lead uh, scholar of Fulbright Amazonia. Astrid Caldas, who is a senior climate scientist for community resilience at the Union of Concerned Scientists. Duilia Mello, who is an astronomer and vice provost of global strategies and professor of physics at the Catholic University of America. Welcome. And the, we, I will ask each of you, starting with Marco Antonio, to deliver uh, initial remarks for three to five minutes, and then we will have a round of questions uh, from the audience, from myself, and also from people who are watching us who can also use the box right below the, the YouTube uh, in our website to send your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, uh, I'm the president of FAPESP, uh, which is a foundation supported by the government of the state of Sao Paulo. It was 
it, it was established in 1962, so we have been around for 60 years, and we support uh, research in any areas of knowledge. So this means uh, natural sciences, uh, social applied sciences, medicine, uh, engineering, and even art. And uh, I will show some slides because it's necessary for what I will say. So, Bruna, I'll sit here so that people can look there. I will do the same. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. When you ask people in Brazil about what are the issues that science and technology could help to solve, they'll have a long list of relevant answers. Inequalities, basic education, higher education, energy, road to the future, for instance, pharmaceutical and vaccine production, quantum technology, in health, cancer, and so on. But when you ask foreigners, most of them will answer the Amazon rainforest. So, why is that? Brazil is not the most important uh, polluter uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the world. Actually, uh, Brazil's CO2 emissions represent only 1.5% of the world total. It's the 12th ranking position and much, much lower than the giants polluters like China, United States, and India. Then, why Amazon is so, has so high visibility in the world? Is it justified in some way? I say, yes, it is, absolutely. Why? First, because Amazon deforestation is the main source of Brazil's emissions. Second point, Amazon represents 54% uh, of all tropical forests remaining in the world. And finally, the Amazon rainforest stores the equivalent to 10 years of global emissions. Thus, preservation of the Amazon, at our view, is not a simple question of a police, but of science based in public policies. And FAPESP has a long experience in supporting uh, programs for research related to sustainability. For instance, uh, we have a, a long, a more than 30 years of a program of biodiversity, bioenergy, clean energy, global climate changes, science in the Amazon. So, we as Bruna has already said, it started with an initiative. At the beginning, it was the state of Sao Paulo and the nine states of the legal Amazon region. But today, it involves 20 states. So it is still being called Amazon plus 10, but actually it's Amazon plus 20. The mission is to use science as a driver to translate to a model of sustainable development of the Amazon. And uh, uh, must remember that the legal Amazon region covers almost 60% of the Brazilian territory and includes a population of 28 million people, meaning 13% of the uh, uh, Brazilian uh, population. And uh, indeed, when we speak of the Amazon, it's not only of forest, it's not only the jungle, it's not only the rivers, but a complex, including 
a very important mix of large metropolitan areas like Manaus, uh, Belém, Santarém, and so on, and uh, small, small, uh, small uh, settlements, farming properties, mining, legal and illegal mining, uh, family agriculture, forest dwellers, and so on. So it, it's a, a, a very complex region. But it's still, as I said, it represents 40, uh, f uh, 54% of the rema remaining uh, tropical forests in the world. And it, is the, it has the largest uh, still proportion of uh, primary uh, forest cover as compared to the others. <coughs> And 60% of the Amazon is inside the Brazilian borders, but it extends to seven other countries indicated there. And what is important, it has, it stores approximately 120 billion tons of uh, CO2. And, uh, uh, the equivalent of 10 years of uh, global fossil fuel uh, emissions. So the specific ob objectives are indicated there. Identification of concrete research challenges, uh, finance mission-oriented research, strengths the regional uh, cooperation, fund collaborative research, and so on. And uh, the challenges involve biodiversity and the climate, climate changes, protection of traditional communities, urban challenges, and uh, uh, bioeconomy as a tool for economic development of the region. Also included in the projection of this, this uh, initiative is the uh, an ambitious mobility program to bring scientists, students, uh, PhD students, postdoctoral fellows, to bring them to the Amazon region for short periods and also for institutional training. Also to support the modernization of the infrastructure uh, and technical training in science and technology in the region. Scientific expeditions. And so we had the first call inside this, the, 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 this initiative. We had 152 proposals submitted. 39 were approved and financed in a total of uh, 42 uh, million real. And uh, just to give you an idea of the spectrum of, uh, of uh, the projects approved, I indicate here some keywords for some of those projects. So uh, they are in the area of uh, medical research, uh, water supply, epidemiological, uh, surveillance, uh, carbon footprint, malaria, dengue, chagas, snake bites, uh, antimicrobial uh, activity of plant uh, residues, and uh, environmental contaminants, sustainable recovery, uh, economic generation, and traditional practices, and so on. So I hope this gives you an idea of this initiative, and uh, uh, we hope uh, uh, that uh, we believe that this will give an opportunity to bring support from international uh, agencies and uh, a large array of uh, uh, institutions to participate in this program in the future, because it's not a single 
point uh, initiative, but it's supposed to be at least for five years. So that's my introduction to this question. Thank you very much. Thank you. In uh, absolutely the problem is like at the global scale, right? So it should be, uh, we should definitely engage um, with uh, international cooperation. So I will move forward to Astrid Caldas, please. Deliver your first remarks. This is on. Okay. Hi, everybody. It's, it's really great to be here and see so many Brazilians. Haven't been around so many Brazilians in such a long time. Um, this is great. And um, so my remarks are um, a, a roundabout of about a lot of things that I hear from my colleagues in Brazil, including in academic institutions and at the uh, IPAM, Institute uh, of Pes Instituto de Pesquisa da Amazônia. So um, the Amazon assessment report from the science panel for the Amazon, now to just this past October, is a comprehensive document focusing on the Amazon we want. It highlights various issues and possible solutions. And a whole section of it, part three of this uh, report, is dedicated to sustainability, restoration, and conservation. And how to prioritize people, areas, resources, and much more in order to achieve true sustainability in the Amazon. Among the important recommendations, empowering and incorporating traditional knowledge into mainstream Western science is a big part of this vision and will create new opportunities for solutions. I know this line of research and action is also part of the US priorities, as the Biden administration just released last week a new guidance for federal departments and agencies on indigenous knowledge. It also held a webinar back in March on traditional knowledge, and not always indigenous, but traditional knowledge in federal policy. So there is a big opportunity there because there is this common interest. The bridge between science and stakeholders is also key, and I know FAPESP has been very keen on that issue in doing this, this connection, bridging this gap. We also must not reinvent the wheel. We not, must not redo what has already been done, but use that as a starting point for future research, a collaborative repository of research to avoid redundance and optimize resources would be ideal. Unicampi has in the past partnered with USAID to research some of the gaps in the Amazon, of knowledge in the Amazon, and the results were very promising. So partnerships and resources for biodiversity surveys are very desirable. There are big gaps in biodiversity knowledge, particularly in the Amazon. We still have to devote some efforts to understanding current and past biodiversity and its role in the conservation of the Amazon. Museu de Zoologia da USP, Museu USP, has an established, very successful research program on Amazonian, um, Amazonian fauna. It is perhaps the main center for studying fish in the Amazon. It has the largest collection of these animals in all of Latin America. And equally important are the collections of insects and birds, bioindicator groups, and a significant number of endangered species. They have records from different periods of time, and I think it would be interesting to have a constant monitoring program for these groups, which are essential for a sustainable Amazon. This is of great interest for Museu de Zoologia da USP to forge partnerships, and I will put a plug here for collaborations between US and Brazil because the current director of the Museu de Zoologia da USP started his career with a um, internship at the Smithsonian Institution. Actually, he started his career in my lab, but I'm not going to say that. Um, he was an undergraduate student in my lab, and then he did a six-week uh, six internship at the Smithsonian that catapulted his career with uh, butterflies uh, and zoology. So, these types of collaboration—excuse me, these types of collaborations—a lot of people don't know about, but they are very important. So, um, Museu de Zoologia da USP is probably the best biodiversity center in Brazil, has a vast scientific collection, and uh, I think USP would be completely supportive of any collaborative ideas. Now, the final thing that I want to leave you with is that we know scientific knowledge is important, but how can we make the bridge with sustainability? Thinking about biodiversity and ecosystem maintenance for a sustainable Amazon is essential. 
especially when we consider the livelihoods of local and indigenous populations, family agriculture, sustainable communities. So this is an interesting question for ecologists, for zoologists, for all kinds of scientists, and the challenge is really exciting, and I'm looking forward to future collaborations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Astrid. Um, I will ask Luis Loredo, please, to deliver your remarks. Okay. Thank you, Bruna. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I, I can see that, um, and I think everybody uh, can see this, that Amazonia as a, sub, as a topic of research and as a topic of survival of the planet became uh, obvious to everybody. So it's in the front page in all newspapers worldwide mostly for negative reasons, not for good reasons. And I think that's what we are trying to start here, is to change this in the near future and have something uh, positive news about, about uh, this important region. So our, our, uh, the contribution of, of the Fulbright program, and I explain to you for those that don't know, the Fulbright program is a worldwide program funded by the State Department and uh, in 49 countries, including Brazil, uh, the program is run through a binational entity. There is the Fulbright Commission in Brazil, and we have a, a board with Americans and Brazilians, and we have uh, representatives of, uh, of uh, the Brazilian government, uh, Itamaraty and uh, Mackey through CAPES, and on the U.S. side, the represent representatives uh, from uh, diplomats. There, there are. Uh, serving at the embassy. So what we are, we, we are doing, so it took a while because things at the State Department always take a while uh, to put this together and we <coughs> launched this program, this is the Fulbright Amazonia, that is similar to two other initiatives that we had in the past, recent past, this is the Fulbright Nexus, there was about sustainability in the Western Hemisphere and the Arctic Initiative, uh, the name, the Arctic uh, it's very similar to the Amazon, com considering this aspect that it went to to uh, uh, support. There is the, the 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 regional aspect of the of the the the, the subject so of everything that we are dealing with. So we have nine countries in the region. Um, so we what we are trying to uh, we know that as Professor Professor Zago just. Uh, mentioned, uh, Brazil is responsible for more than 50% of the uh, of the Amazon uh, rainforest, but still there is a lot of a lot of going on in our neighbor countries in eight neighbor countries. So the whole idea here is uh, through this program that it will be led by uh, prof uh, Professor uh, Jeffrey uh, Hall and professor, uh, professor from UC Santa Barbara and Professor Carlos Valerio from Federal do Pará in Belém. Uh, uh, it's to be put together a network of uh, researchers from all nine countries in the region, including uh, Americans, to deal with regional aspects of, uh, that, of, the, of the Amazon uh, problem, if you can say so. Um, so this is... Uh, uh, something that we, uh, as I said, we, we, we have been, we, we did in the past. Uh, we are very optimistic uh, that we will we'll have very good uh, people working this project. We have more than four, 500 candidates for now for this uh, program. We don't have that many resources to support all the 400, we work only with 16, so we were sure that we will need to be very, very, uh, very carefully choose those that will participate, but this is a program that will not s stop here. Uh, the deadline is December 20th, so we, are, we have the funding for the uh, next call of, this, uh, of the Fulbright Initiative, uh, and this uh, Fulbright Amazonia, and I think we, we can see that we have the momentum for, for the, to, to deal with such a complex and, and important uh, issue. So uh, I, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm 
very say, eager to see the synergy that we can we can have among uh, here Brazilians, but with, through Fulbright we can do this with uh, the other uh, countries uh, <coughs> that are also part of uh, the the Amazonia. Okay, thank you so much for your attention, and I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Bruna. Thank you, Duilia. Well, thank you, Bruna. Thank you, everybody, and uh, thank you, the Winslow Center, for for this opportunity. So, I, I'm Duilia Mello. I'm a Vice Provost for Global Strat Strategies at Catholic University of America. <laughs> I'm an astrophysicist, and I um, grew up in Brazil. I studied in Brazil, and I'm here. I've been here for 25 years. So. Um, I am also a, a professor uh, of physics and astronomy at Catholic University. And it's with great concern that I teach my astronomy course every year and see very little change about climate change. So uh, I see that as my role as an educator and as a scientist to promote a, a better world and also to um, educate our young uh, population about the need of taking care of our planet. So when I um, decided to become an astronomer, I wanted to know the universe as the, the, my palma de mia mão, as my hand. And I, I can say today that I almost do, but uh, what concerns me the most in our days is our own planet. And the fact that people don't understand that there is no planet B. So people don't understand the Amazon, and people don't know um, how important the ecosystem of the Amazon is for the entire planet. So um, I have started a new project recently that I, it is actually just for that, to actually to tell the people about the importance of taking care of our planet. It's very easy for us to sit here and say that, but what are we doing to change that? What are the measures that we can do to change it now, to start a change that should have started many decades ago? So when you have a summit, when you have a, a, an entire a month dedicated to um, climate change discussions in a country like Egypt, and the main sponsor is Coca-Cola, brings you to reflect on that. Uh, so I am very pleased to see that important foundations like FAPESP and like Fulbright are engaging in uh, questions of climate change, but I don't see them communicating with the public, especially with the Brazilian public. You cannot ask people to stop polluting if they don't understand that pollution is one of the reasons that we are going towards climate change. So we need to uh, have, uh, as Professor Zago said, public policies are extremely important and we need to tell the public that we are working on it. It's too slow the way we are doing. We have to do better. So my role as an educator, as a scientist, is to promote that, is to actually try to do in a way that science is respected and science and fake news do not spread as they did recently. We need to actually come up with projects that promote these fantastic initiatives. We don't do that well enough. I'm gonna tell you today about one particular project that nobody knows. The project is nothing but a collaboration of NASA in the city of Rio de Janeiro. Did you ever know that there is a project called NASA Rio? NASA Rio, yeah, there is, since 2015. And nobody knows this because we don't discuss it. We don't tell the public things we've been doing. So this is what my project is doing right now. I'm starting to tell the public more about projects that are working on this. So I will be doing this. I will be looking at what FAPESP is doing, what Fulbright is doing, and I'm going to be promoting for free your work because that's what I do and what I've done for, for a long time. So um, my, my first... Hashtag is called NASA olha para terra. NASA looks at Earth. Because people don't understand that a lot of the NASA's budget goes to Earth sciences. 
and I have my foot inside NASA, and I've had my foot inside NASA for 25 years. So uh, that's my, uh, my goal now is to actually educate everyone about this, that NASA is helping, Brazil is helping the city of Rio de Janeiro to um, prevent disasters with a warning system that actually works to prevent a lot of the floods we have in Rio caused by climate change. So this is something that I will, um, you will hear more about it. Um, also, the project is called CART, C-A-Art. It's science together with art, and how we one day be able to say that science is helping us to change the world and to improve our quality of living. So I will be talking more about this, and I hope you will join me on this movement that is to explain to everybody, I want this kind of conversation to happen in the bakeries, nas padarias do Brasil. I want this, to, this conversation to happen everywhere we go so people respect science and see that science is the only way we have to help the planet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Duilia. And I think that one of the questions is how, uh, the, the, that's uh, the question behind innovation, how those, uh, the sciences actually have an impact on the material world, like real life of people. That's the way how people are going to um, actually perceive that, not only understanding about the existence of a project, but having their lives change by those science. So that's, the, the, I think, the, the key to that. I'd like to ask Jeffrey, Hall to deliver his uh, remarks. Ho, I, I don't know if I, I pronounced it correctly. <laughs> Apologies if I didn't. You can use mine. Okay, thank you. Hi, it's actually Holly. I was gonna. Holly. Yeah, okay. yeah thank you for, for asking. I, but my students always say whole as well. Um, <laughs> um, so thank you very much, Bruna, for organizing this. It's uh, my pleasure to be here with you all today. I think. It's especially um, fortuitous that it's happening now. I th it feels like a, a, a new sort of period um, in Brazil. I was there just before the elections and things were a little bit more bleak, um, more smoky specifically it was. Yes. Um, and now um, with uh, the elections, um, hearing about these new research partnerships, all of the international attention, it feels like a, a nice time to, to be able to come together and talk about this and make new um, uh, partnerships and collaborations. So um, I am the co-lead scholar of the F new Fulbright Amazonia um, program, along with Valerio Gomez, who's uh, a professor at the University Federal, the Federal University of Pará in Berlin. Um, this program, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview about it today and uh, tell you about the themes. Um, it will bring together 16 researchers um, from across uh, eight Amazonian nations and the U.S. Um, the objective being to perform applied and socially relevant uh, research that can inform policy and provide innovative solutions for a more sustainable Amazonian, Amazon, Amazon basin. We also hope to generate more of a, a, a pan-Amazonian um, network of researchers and uh, a deeper understanding of the region beyond these, these boundaries that we have put on it, be they within Brazil in terms of states or across in, um, nation states or indigenous territories. We, we hope to kind of help, help understand on a deeper level across these boundaries. Um, so researchers will work in multidisciplinary uh, teams to engage in collaborative thinking, analysis, problem solving, and, and multidisciplinary research in three thematic areas. Uh, we define, Valerio and I define these areas by talking to experts of the Amazon, including people from IPAM, which you mentioned, the um, the Amazon We Want report was, was also very useful. There's a lot of uh, great work being done in Brazil, and we wanted to make sure we um, incorporated that into our, our, our themes. All the themes have a focus on envir the environment, but also on humans and people and, hum and communities. Um, it's, it's not innovative to say that we don't want pure conservation or pure economic development at this point in time, but we emphasize that, that each of our themes has these, these we want to incorporate how humans are relating to their, 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 their natural environment, um, what they think about nature, how they understand their natural resources and their relationship with it, with those. 
Um, so the first theme is, is climate change ad adaptation and mitigation. This is really motivated by, obviously, what we've all been talking about, but a, a fundamental question of what's happening in the region and, what, and how are people responding to climate change. Um, especially how are those groups that are most vulnerable, indigenous traditional populations, family farmers, how are they adapting? And these are in particular the groups who had the deepest knowledge and ability to adapt and understand their environments and the, and the potential impacts. Um, but the baselines have been shifted, things are um, changing. Uh, how are they facing these situations? How can their knowledge be incorporated um, and combined with technological approaches, uh, policy to, to in, in, in policy that can be um, useful in certain contexts, but also perhaps scaled um, up and, and across the region. The second theme we're focusing on is called strengthening human and environmental health, environmental health and security. This one is a, again motivated by a question that we kept hearing by talking to people um, who are experts in the region. Uh, what are the main or emerging threats in the area? Um, this is largely what you do hear about in the news as you talked about deforestation, land grabbing, uh, mining. Uh, so here the focus is not so much on the environment or, or climate change as a structuring force, but on the political, economic, and social systems that um, generate negative environmental and social impacts in, in Amazonia. So we're excited to see uh, research that examines these emerging, overlooked, or misunderstood phenomena in, 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 a, in, a, in a region that is often thought of as unchanging to some extent, but is where the people, the environment, everything is changing quite rapidly. So potential topics could include new dynamics of, of, of financing, um, land grabs, impediments to zero deforestation agreements, regional cross-border um, networks um, and their role in trafficking, land conflict, public insecurity, um, especially in these, some of the regions where I work, in, in Acre, on the border of Peru, Bolivia, it's, it, you need to understand these, these cross-boundary issues as well. Um, and thirdly, bioeconomy and sustainable development. Um, this one is motivated by the question of, well, we know the threats, we know the, the challenging things that are happening, but what potential solutions are there? In, Bioeconomy uh, has really emerged as one of the more promising um, solutions in the region, with a lot of that generated by, uh, within, with particular to the Amazon region. Um, and the emphasis with bioeconomy, at least as we've conceptualized or want to emphasize it, is um, that it, 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 it is based on um, locally embedded economies, um, um, and it has environmental, social, and, um, and economic benefits for those communities. Um, and so we would support uh, research on ground-based innovation efforts aimed at, at developing these locally embedded economies. So that's a quick sort of summary of, 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 of the program and the, and the, primor the primary themes. Thank you, Jeffrey. And uh, now we, uh, I will move to Carlos and then Anderson. Uh, or uh, both provosts, one of USP, the other one of ITA, two of like, I would say, Brazil Ivy League's universities. So please, Carlotti. Well, thank you very much for the invitation from the Wilson Center and FAPESP. I represent the University of Sao Paulo, but also I speak on behalf of Unicamp and UNESP to all the university in the state. São Paulo, support by the, the government of São Paulo is unique in Brazil. We have three uh, universities support by the state and very well uh, ranking in Brazil and, and also worldwide. Uh, my office is concerned about three things in, in, in our university. First one, inequalities. The second one, innovation. And the third, and third one, we are talking about sustainability. So I will describe two initiatives of the university to, to deal with, to do, to do, is it working? Yeah. Of, of, okay, I will describe two initiatives to, to deal with uh, sustainability. The first one was the creation of a, a program with 47 uh, PhDs and postdoc students to work with political uh, of un university to create conditions in our campus to increase the uh, or decrease the emission of CO2 
and to 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 show the society that we can do better than we can now in Brazil. So I hope to have 25% of energy uh, self-produced by by university uh, using photovoltaic uh, program. So it, it's it's a very challenging, uh, but I, I think I will we will do it in our in the next three years of, of my my office in the university. Uh, the second program was the, the creation of a center to study the Amazon region. And Professor Paul Artacho, a very known researcher, will be uh, leading the, this program and will be a, will be a, a very productive program and interdisciplinary. As you told before, Museu de Zoologia will participate of this initiative, but, all, but also Museum of Archaeology, Museum of Archaeology, that's a very important museum of our university also, and other areas, because Amazon region is very, uh, it's a very complex uh, word. For example, there are more than 100 native languages in Amazon region. So it's not uniform. There are several Amazon regions inside the, the Amazon region. So it's economic. We have, as Professor Zago said, there are economic problems, there are social problems, there are problems with the forests, the health condition of the population in the Amazon region. And I believe that the, the Amazon uh, protection will not, be, will not be defined by law. It doesn't matter the, the, if there is a law or there is, a, there is not a law. To, to say that we should protect the Amazon, but we should, this, the, the main fact that we will protect the Amazon is the science, and not, and not the laws. That's why we create this program that I believe that we will be very busy in the, in the next years, because of FAPESP, different from NIH, for example, they don't have intramural research. Uh, FAPESP is a funding agency and our universities, they, we are our, the best customers of, of, of FAPESP. <laughs> so uh, USP, Unicamp, UNESP probably have, what's the percentage of the budget of FAPESP, Zago? Six percent, the three? Eight percent of the budget of. Ten percent probably to ITA. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and Professor Luis Mello told me that it will increase it one hundred percent to to the to university. But, well, th th that's a, a brief comment about the University of São Paulo and the, the Unicamp and UNESP. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Anderson, please. So hello, uh, can you hear? So I'm very happy because Professor Zago is giving 10% of a PESP to ITA, so I'm very excited. I'm going to Brazil very happy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's on record. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, I'm the president of ITA. Uh, ITA is an organization of the Brazilian Air Force under the Department of Science and Technology. Aerospace Science Technology. Uh, ITA is in the aerospace cluster of São José dos Campos. So my, my intention is today to talk a little bit about what aerospace can do uh, for the Amazon and what it is doing right now. Uh, several organizations uh, stay in São José dos Campos, most of them, and I'd say 100% of them that I'm on a site now, it were created by former ITA students. So Embraer and Embraer Group have Vision and Attack. We have IMPE. IMPE was created by a, also a former student. Uh, IMPE developed several satellites for surveillance of the Earth. And the last one that was launched last year in February is the satellite Amazonia. And this satellite is the first 100% Brazilian satellite with the software, uh, also uh, national. By the way, the, the director of the program was, is our former student. And uh, it's important for surveillance, for monitoring, and also to combat illegal deforestation. 
And they also have a series of satellites, uh, the, the Cybers, with China, and were developed in the last 30 years and uh, intended to also for surveillance. Uh, ITA and AP has developed uh, an initiative called SPORT, supported by FAPES, by the way, and NASA. The satellite, the CubeSat, was launched last week from uh, Kennedy Space Center in Florida, launched from SpaceX. It is not in orbit yet because it's in the International Space Station, and uh, they're going to be in orbit in the, last, the next two, one or two weeks. Uh, this CubeSat is for uh, climate weather observation. We have an anomaly in the equatorial region of the world, including the Amazon. Uh, it's very difficult for communications in this area due to this anomaly of the ionosphere. And this CubeSat is intending to do research with INPE and three uh, US universities, uh, Utah, Alabama, and Texas, to do research with support from FAPESP to uh, explore uh, ways to solve this anomaly and improve communication and also uh, movement of airplanes, cell phone communications, GPS, and for ships. Uh, and in the sequence, we have an, uh, a series of three new satellites. Uh, they called ITASAT-2. It's been developed with support from Israel, Technion, and with NASA as well. This is going to be supported by Ministry of Science and Technology through FINEP and Space Agency, Brazilian Space Agency. And, uh, it's three uh, satellites in, in, an, in a flight because uh, it's good for geolocalization and also for improving communication in Amazon, movement of ships, airplanes, and, and, and also uh, for landing and uh, departing of aircraft on the airports. Uh, besides the satellite area going to aeronautical now, uh, Embraer company, uh, with the Brazilian Air Force, they have developed, developed the DKC-39 aircraft. This is a new cargo aircraft designed for the Amazon. And uh, when the oxygen uh, crisis in Manaus uh, happened, this aircraft was very efficient because it's twice faster than the competitor. And they, they fly uh, oxygen uh, in very fast and it was good to, to solve the crisis there. And this, this aircraft, uh, the Air Force is going to have uh, around 15 aircrafts in the medium term. But also Embraer is exporting the, the aircraft to Portugal, Hungary, Holland. And also the US Air Force is studying the, the certification of the KC-39 for the future use of the US Air Force. So this in terms of uh, technology. Also, the ATEC, uh, belonging to Embraer Company, they have developed several softwares for the uh, surveillance of the Amazon, the, the CVAN system. Mm -hmm. And it's in Sindacta 4 in Manaus, and uh, their traffic control is managed by this company. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, aerospace technology can support the Amazon surveillance and deforestation, monitoring uh, for deforestation. Uh, one uh, another initiative not involved directly of VITA is a former student of VITA, the class 74. Uh, his name is Carlos Nobre, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, many people, everybody knows him. And he, he's a student, he was a student of VITA and MIT. He took a PhD at the MIT. And uh, he was at it uh, two weeks ago, and he was talking about a new initiative. And he's, he's just talking about this in the media. He wants to create the ITA of Amazon. Not uh, ITA per se, but uh, inspired on ITA and MIT. So to, the, to develop technologies, and I like very much his idea. I knew he was invited to come here, but he cannot. So, so I'm uh, announcing this initiative. And, uh, not announcing, but uh, uh, forwarding what he's saying in the media. So uh, I think that uh, this research that FAPES is doing is a way to incentivize research in the, in the, in the kind of research at the Amazon. Absolutely. And uh, I've been also discussing, it's great that you brought it up, um, Carlos Nobre's initiative. He's calling it um, MIT, M as in Amazon. 
and I believe it. Uh, his uh, his uh, premise is very well connected to exactly all the story that you were you were telling us about Ita, which is Brazil once upon a time. Uh, created ETA, and uh, that perhaps that's one of the main reasons why Brazil has so much advantages in terms of aeronautics, and uh, created not only the technology, the science, but also the workforce. And that's the the, the thing that the, the kind of vision, the strategic vision for the long term that we have to have if we want to invest in Brazil as a green, uh, in, in green and clean futures in terms of low carbon economy, bioeconomy and creating a platform for that. And that's what I think is behind the, the vision for Carlos, of Carlos Nobre, which the Wilson Center and Brazil Institute has been also in dialogue with him and in seeing how can we, we uh, support. And also I think that oh, another aspect that you mentioned and I think is a great highlight is the, you, na you named a number of international corporations with so funding not only from Brazil, from FAPESP, Brazilian taxpayers supporting this science, but also international cooperation with the United States, with Israel, you mentioned a couple, and I think that's one of the main reasons why we are here, discussing uh, international cooperation in the scope of a region that is globally important. I'd say, I'd say universally important since we are talking with uh, astronomers here as well. So I will open for questions. We have a number of specialists here in the room and uh, we also have uh, questions coming from the audience watching online. So feel free, you all have a microphone in front of you. If you don't, I can hand it. So anyone wanna uh, comment or ask a question right now? Or if not, no? Yes. Go ahead. Can you please introduce yourself to the um, audience? Sure. Uh, Bob Kosak uh, from Atlantic Biomass. Uh, is this on? Not on. Now it's on. Bob Kosak from Atlantic Biomass. And uh, I've had a little uh, experience in 2014 and 15 in something called the Global Innovation Initiative with the University of Sao Paulo with Igor, Igor Polakoff and his work, and we were doing stuff on uh, recycling of polymers and composites. Uh, it was with uh, Ohio State University, uh, University of Sao Paulo, and University of Bath in England. So I sort of remember something about international cooperation on this. And um, the only thing I, I would like to say is that I think that especially in the case of the United States with Brazil, that we need more formal treaties. We need more formal organizations between us. Uh, I think it's kind of amazing that you have these two large economies, two large countries in the Western Hemisphere, and they don't really have any treaties on anything. <laughs> and it's, I, I think it would be a, a great benefit in building off of what, what's going, what you're talking about going on in, in Amazona, that maybe it's time that we start formalizing these, these discussions. And I bring this up uh, in terms of BRICS in the countries, in BRICS are doing things with you, the United States is doing things. But I sort of pose this as a question that um, when we talk about cooperation, it seems like what we're really seeing more, not cooperation, but we're seeing competition. We're seeing China saying we're putting in this money. The United States is saying we're putting in this much money. And it, from my perspective, from, from afar, it looks like this is not a matter of cooperation of trying to accomplish anything, but rather it's competition between individual states to show their roles here. Uh, so do you think it's important or something that as we go forward with this, with the science, to try to build in more of really good treaty obligations between the countries to advance the saving of Amazona. No, maybe the Professor Zago can. <laughs> okay. Uh, Working? It doesn't seem to. Okay. What I've been seeing in the last years is that uh, cooperation in science and technology between, I'm looking at the state of Sao Paulo because uh, that's what is near me, uh, is increasing proportionally with 
countries such as Germany, UK, France, because there is a very important institutional effort on the part of these countries. So we have uh, uh, many agreements with important and strong science and technology institutions in uh, Germany. And, and then when you look at the outcomes of a research, for instance, published research in collaboration, it's still United, United States is the most important partner with Brazil. But this proportion is decreasing. And this important partnership is traditional because it was established many years ago when United States was almost the only place where Brazilian would come to get a scientific training in advance. So this started uh, around the end of the Second World War. A lot of Brazilians came to the States. At that moment, there, was, there were initiatives, strong, for instance, Rockefeller Foundation, et cetera, were doing a lot of work with Brazil. And this established the basis of many, many Brazilians would come on their own or with the scarce support and would come to be trained in science, would return to Brazil and keep for their lives the, the relationship. But uh, actually, the, 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 the relationship between uh, the state of Sao Paulo institutions and even Brazil with the institutions in the United States is not very strong, except for a few, like NSF, for instance, which is the main partner of FAPESP in the United States. And H is much lesser, and uh, it's, it's very scarce. So it is still is maintained because there are those traditional links between laboratory research groups and so on. I don't know if I, I, I actually answered your question, but this is something I have been seeing those years. I don't know if Pache could like to, to add something. Okay, go ahead. So uh, uh, concerning the uh, treaties, like you mentioned, the agreements, uh, I'm not talking about the Amazon, but when we were starting cooperation with NASA five years ago, uh, we didn't, uh, we couldn't start without the, the agreements because space is protected by ITAR and so. So we got the money from FAPESP, we got the, uh, the, the money from NASA, but they say don't start without the agreement. So uh, the space agency proposed the agreement to US and it was approved at the Congress in Brazil, but the, the uh, Senate and, and then after it was approved by the president, we could start. So I think uh, uh, for some areas of research, it's necessary to have the agreements in space is one example. Okay. Um, along these lines, I would say that it, 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 what you, you're, you're talking about is very connected to the model of the, the countries, those countries we mentioned work. The U.S. is essentially a... a, a, a this, everything is decentralized, so it's it's much more difficult to to establish uh, cooperation and an agreement in be between countries, between nations with Brazil and the U.S. So it's much easier with Germany or France because there are these central um, central uh, entities. By the way, very similar to what we have in Brazil, we are a kind of a federation, but still there are doubts about that. So, um, so this is the reason why. But does, this doesn't, uh, is, it's, it doesn't make more, it can make more difficult, but it's not impossible to cooperate. It's what exactly Professor Zago said. I, I, made, I did some research before uh, starting the, this Amazon program, and over the 10 years, if you look for the most cited papers 
published in, in indexed uh, magazine uh, uh, journals. You have um, with, uh, papers with uh, co-authoring. You have 50% um, are uh, of the papers are, have authors from Brazil, and 25 authors from Brazil and the U.S. and 25 for the, all the other countries. So there's a lot going on. Um, it, I would never wait for a treaty to work because this can take forever. I can tell you the, the commission started in Brazil through a bilateral agreement in 1957, and when we signed the new agreement in 2008, um, uh, the new bilateral agreement, it took forever to make it uh, be approved in Brazil by the Brazilian Council. It didn't need to be approved in, on, on the U.S. side because of the level of the agreement. The, the U.S. universities, like Catholic universities and many others, they have their tools, their means of of cooperation with uh, institutions like FAPESP and many others in Brazil. So I think there's a lot we, we can do. So don't wait for for governments that much. So, so. Yeah. This is my uh, so as a, as a researcher uh, who has been doing research for 25 years in the United States and as a Brazilian. I'll tell you, yes, do not wait for treats. Also because um, of the politics. So uh, every time we change who is in control in Brazil, things kind of take forever to then get back into the track again. So it's better to do institutional treats like we do, Memorandum of Understandings and, and go, go after that. But as, um, can, I, can I use yours? Sure. Oh, no, now it's back. As, as um, Anderson was saying, there are institutions and institutions. When, you, when you're talking NASA, then you really need to do national level because of all the, the, the bureaucracy involved. Uh, and it takes much longer, too. And when I say the word longer, that's what's complicated with Brazil, too, because Brazil doesn't have long-term plannings for anything. So everything in Brazil is very, um, to do things in Brazil, it's like five years way in the future in Brazil. And it shouldn't be like that. It should, we should plan for 10 years, 15, 20. And we don't do that kind of planning. So when you do institutional uh, agreements, it's much easier to, to move it forward. Can I ask a question? There's one thing I, I, I totally get, uh, everything you, you were saying about not waiting for the government, but it is one aspect where government is important, which is governance and regulation, right? And how, how the regulatory framework for science and innovation in Brazil when it comes to intellectual property, when it comes to protection for actually other uh, players in the world invest in Brazil for that. How, uh, how is that, uh, what, what is the state uh, of art in terms of that? Um, what could be improved, what could be advocated for? for improvements in this, in this front. Who, uh, anyone wanna? Uh, I guess that our legal framework for innovation increased a lot in, in the last, two, <coughs> I would say, four or six years. Improved yeah, improved a lot with uh, the federal level and the state level also. Uh, I believe that we have uh, a lot of problem in, in the university we don't believe in the federal law. Sometimes the federal the federal law uh, supports some some action, but we don't believe and, and do t we don't do our re regulation of university is more restrictive than the federal law. So we have to work in, at home now in in our university to change this situation. I don't know if if you agree with me. But the federal regulation is very nice right now. We have some, and state of Sao Paulo also. So I, I, I think the problem is not the law. The problem is the behavior of people at the university and the companies also. Compliance. Yeah, compliance and other, and, and other issues. We have to believe that we can do more. Not wait for the Supreme Court to tell you that you can, right? <laughs> yes, sometime the, uh, our, our lawyers, I don't know how to say in our law, inside the university, they say, professor, I, I know that, the the, yeah. The law offices that yes. regulate the, 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 the 
decisions, the decisions, they are extremely conservative inside of our universities. They say, professor, I know that it's written you can do, but pay attention, professor. I don't know, you can go to jail. Uh, don't do that. Uh, that's the main problem. I, I think it's inside the university, not the federal law. Yeah. It creates some sort of hesitocracy, as I say. We are always like hesitating and waiting for the... Can, can I say something funny? I actually have brought many uh, pieces of equipment in my luggage to Brazil because it's so hard to do imports. Right? So if anything below, I don't know, $1,000, you can bring. So I've had many, and I won't say which university. <laughs> I've had uh, many wish lists that my friends have sent to me, and I just go to shop online and bring them with my luggage. To so, so this is... This is what we face sometimes, the internally hard to, to do certain things. But you're right that in the past six years, they have stopped asking. So I think things are better in that. Yes, uh, uh, I think there is a lot of uh, stories about the past. Actually, uh, there, is, uh, there is no restriction today. It's easy. Uh, at least uh, FAPESP can provide imports of any equipment or reagent, anything that the researchers need to use in the different universities in the state of Sao Paulo. So this is not anymore something that makes difficult to do research in Brazil. There, is, there are a lot of jokes and old stories, but I'd say the the, the scenario changed very much. I, I agree with that. That's what I'm saying, that in the past six years, they have stopped asking. I think, I think it's very much. Okay, thank you. So I'll give one example. Uh, we have a, a strong partnership with Embraer. Embraer is private, so we have to sign agreements with them. When they were state-owned, belonging to the Air Force, it was easier, but private, mm -hmm. it's more difficult. But anyway, uh, we did some agreements, ITA, Embraer, and also, by the way, you have a new innovation center uh, supported by FAPESP and 50 million reais, and it's going to, it's in my uh, email to sign this agreement, by the way, and after that, Zago is signed next week, hopefully. That's it, a 10%? Uh, yeah, sort of, no, not, not, not 10% yet, but it's, it's getting there. But, uh, it's on the way, yeah. Next year, we, we can increase a little more. But uh, the agreement with Embraer is very good in terms of intellectual property. But on the, on the opposite, we have a company from the US, an, an aircraft company in, in, in the US, and he came to ITA. We were discussed for one year, the, the agreement. But it was not our fault. It was the company. They wanted 100% of the intellectual property. Mm -hmm. And we said, no, we need uh, some uh, return for, for, the, for, for it, for students, for professors. And they say no. Uh, if it's only, it's not 100%, we, we cannot go ahead. So we could not. Uh, so some companies, they, they don't like Brazilian laws because they, you know, and, and then it's difficult to do. But the law is good, I think. May I add one quick thing? We're talking a lot about innovation and technology and companies, but I would like to pull to the biodiversity and the exchange of specimens and uh, the trade of specimens for research across researchers between the US and Brazil is still very much stuck. People are worried about being taken, being arrested and you know all kinds of things. So that's one point where I think a collaboration or a treaty. We have MOUs between institutions, but something at a higher level would help immensely, particularly for the conservation biodiversity field. Perfect. I'm glad you brought it up because in the bioeconomy it's all about that, like how do you gonna you're going to create value out of it. At the same time, you protect the forest, but create a value out, out of that natural resource. And value means jobs and, you know, growth. Any, anyone want to say something? Please go ahead. 
Thank you, Bruna. And uh, thank you, panelists. I want to congratulate all of you for your amazing initiatives that you're uh, undertaking. Um, and, and this is a wonderful time just to uh, echo Professor Holly's uh, comments. Um, this is a wonderful time to think about and renovate some, some amazing collaborations and partnerships. My name is Jeremy Campbell. I'm an anthropologist as well. I've worked in the Amazon since 1999 on uh, indigenous land rights issues, Grilaj and Jiteha, um, the, the situation uh, when it comes to real estate and territorial management in the region, which as you all know and can appreciate is incredibly complex. Um, but nevertheless, we, we hope dies last, right? And I'm incredibly buoyed by your, by your inspiration and your hope. And I want to return to something that uh, Professor Carlotti uh, said, uh, which I couldn't agree with more, that the Amazon will not be saved through law, right? We've had a command and control sort of uh, philosophy for a very long time in Brazil, not, well, not alone in Brazil, but um, we've seen diminishing returns on the uh, sort of social buy-in when it comes to that approach. And so I'm as optimistic as the next person, and I share uh, you know, your, your approach as a panel to the hope that science and innovation can provide that solve, can provide that you know, next uh, Amazonia 4.0, right, to, to actually say, uh, to, to borrow a term from uh, Professor Nobri. But I, I have a bit of skepticism, and I'd like to hear your thoughts as a panel on the social value of that. Um, in, in other words, uh, when you see, as we've seen in the United States, a kind of anti-intellectualism, a kind of skepticism of science, uh, we see fake news circulating on WhatsApp. We saw the very regrettable news out of Brazil on Tuesday from Mekki that 200,000 bolsistas are going to go without their, you know, their, their funding. So there's, there, we're at a calamitous, uh, I think, moment when it comes to the social value assigned to science and innovation. There's a lot of skepticism, especially among those 28 million people who live in the Amazon actually, many of whom, um, well, let's just say it's, it's a diverse array of uh, attitudes when it comes to education, science, innovation, et cetera. So um, how, how do you think about that, uh, establishing the social trust that is important and invaluable for innovation and science to truly um, flourish in the region and be led by Amazonian protagonists? Education, education, education. So we need to educate not just the children's schools, but the public, right? There's no other way. We need to educate the people of Amazon. We need them to trust science. We need to, to show them that science is coming out of Amazon. I'm running. I'm so we, that's what we need to do, right? We need a movement that will connect the scientists with the public. Uh, not all scientists know how to do that. So we need to invest on communication of science. We haven't done that in Brazil ever. So this is something, if you Google who is the scientist that's most known outside Brazil, that is me. Okay. So um, nobody does that in Brazil. It's really not very well done. So how do we communicate that to the people of Amazon? We need a movement. We need to educate the children and we need to educate their parents. So WhatsApp is going to kill us all. So uh, fake news is spreading like diseases, right? So we need um, a movement of change. And I took that to myself as something that I am doing. And I hope others will, you know, kind of see that as an example. I have a lot of followers that are trying to do some things too, but it's a slow motion and we can't wait. So I get very anxious about it. Yes, um, thank you for the question. I think it's important to think about these more social and times moral questions here um, of people from the U.S. or from Sao Paulo coming to the Amazon and doing research. And I think Amazonia Plus 10 is, a, is great in that it, 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 there, there, there are these partnerships established between people from these different regions because there's a fundamental inequality of, of, the, of the regions and there's a lot of um, telling people what's, what they should care about um, that comes off, I mean, the believing in fake news, maybe we disagree with the content, but there's a resentment there that I think needs to be recognized. Um, and that addressing that, that inequality and, and attempting to 
improve the situation in Amazonia, I think is fundamental for then that me that those messages, that science being able to get through in some in some capacity, because it's it's gotten much worse um, compared to you know the last uh, ten years ago or so. It's it's much more polarized, and I think that there's people have gotten to the point now that they're comfortable enough to me, with me to, to tell me that you know, what's wrong with everything I think in the Amazon and, and, and it's quite an extensive list and it's, it starts with like people who look up at the airplanes and wonder where they're going and what it's like on the inside and I'm like well I've got to catch my flight you know and and and, and then and they're just they're saving up for a motorcycle or something um, and so it's but in, in they're waiting, like, you're from California, where's that money we've been waiting for, been promising for decades, you know? And so there's a, a need to, for, for, for responsible sort of moral engagement that is more equal um, between the regions. So I'd like to say, I work with science communication too, not in Brazil. And uh, right now we're very much engaged with um, disinformation and misinformation. And we have a coalition, we are part of a coalition. And of course, as you know, it is very, very complex because it's not just a matter of telling people what is the truth. It's a matter of connecting with people with the truth, right? So I cannot just tell you something and you're gonna say, what's in it for me? Where's the beef? You know, so you gotta really think about how you're going to communicate. And I'm very, very interested in your initiative because we have been fighting uh, disinformation, not only on WhatsApp, because WhatsApp is not that big here, but Twitter, Facebook, all these platforms, including TikTok, uh, all these places, they are spreading misinformation, and there is disinformation, which is those things that are planted directly by people who know it's a lie, but it's to their interest to say that, and people just spread it like fire because they think it's the truth because of their perception. So how do we get to that perception? How do we change the perception? How do we connect with people, right? Yeah. So, so the, the answer, in my opinion, to that is with art, because art is universal. So we can only leave our bubbles, because we all here live in a bubble, we're talking to ourselves, right? So we are not communicating, this is not gonna get out of, the, of this bubble, right? Uh, we can only get out of this bubble if we build bridges between bubbles, and it's really through art that we can do that. So through artists, so partnerships with science and artists that we can do, and that's what I'm trying to do. So <laughs> we have a science uh, for art uh, fund that we give money to artists to put science out. We should talk. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So yeah, we will we will talk definitely. Uh, but we need uh, Brazilian uh, artists uh, engaging on this, um, and uh, I have been identifying several of those artists, and I know some of them personally. So. So I, uh, it's, it's, the movement is starting, and I hope in two years from now, you're gonna remember this day. Okay, um, sorry, go ahead. Okay, I can tell you something. Uh, for instance, uh, I know we at FAPESP, we have uh, important uh, initiatives to communicate uh, with the population, mostly with the scientists and the uh, scientific community, but also we we'll try to reach the general population. And uh, indeed, uh, we, the scientists are not trained to do that. So some of our recent initiatives are uh, focused on the question of uh, training the scientists to talk to the general population. That's one point. The second point is, uh, indeed, when you look, for instance, uh, at the question of the Amazon, there are a few scientists who have space in uh, television, in the programs, and they talk about but they always talk about fires and devastation. And this creates a sensation that scientists only think about that. And also it creates 
antagonism from the government. Obviously, I will not discuss what happened in this four-year period of a government. But uh, that's the only focus that the population have the opportunity to see scientists speak about the Amazon. So at the moment we are planning, I don't know if we will be able to do that or not, but we are planning with the state television of the state of Sao Paulo to make a long series of a, a reportage of a reports about the Amazon region, about the scientific uh, uh, questions and the life in the Amazons. So we'll support this. So it'll be this. programs on TV? Big program on for a, lo a long series, uh, supposed to take one year, every, every week, one, one program, one uh, episode of this series. We hope we'll be able to finance this, but we will need also private money to, to support this initiative. But that's the way, I think, that's something we need to introduce. People should look at television and see scientists and talking with people from the region and talking about the problems of the region and showing the, the, the situation, this, the, 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 the exceptional Thank you. I get one more comment from the audience. Uh, so I would like to make just a few comments. Um, introduce yourself. Yes, please. I'm Paulo Nussensweig, um, Provost for Research and Innovation at the University of Sao Paulo. Um, first comment about artists. Um, there's a great artist, a great Brazilian artist, who has already scored twice in the World Cup, actually three times in the World Cup, Richard Lisson who has promoted science through his uh, shoes, sports shoes, and is a great ally, and so we should count on him. And of course, uh, <laughs> tomorrow for other reasons. The, uh, uh, another point, just to reassure, um, we've been following very closely, and uh, maybe 20 minutes ago, there's news that 160 million reais were freed for copies, and so the scholarships Hallelujah. will be paid. Um, finally, I want to say that, indeed, I, I, I definitely agree that art is a universal language, just as math. And uh, the way misinformation is spreading is something which can be studied with scientific methodology. Um, it is being studied with scientific methodology. And recently, we've been in conversations with Instituto Serra Pilheira and our AI center at the University of Sao Paulo to build AI to shape messages that will promote science among the general audience. So the idea is to learn you know, what resonates and then use that kind of message in order to connect. So science can do a big, you know, big deal there too. Fantastic. I have, uh, Paulo wanna say one thing, and I, after Paulo I wanna say, uh, please join us after that for drinks and uh, refreshments behind that door. Paulo? Hi there, thank you. Just, I'm reminded of something that FAPESP has done for years which is to educate journalists about science. I know about this because I've been in some of those. So continue to do that because, uh, so the idea is not general. Educate the communicators because Brazilian journalists, there are few that understand science. Most of them don't. And FAPESP has done pioneering work on that and should continue. Thank you, Paolo. Thank can you. Can I add one thing? Just, just yeah. okay. I, can't, I can't resist. <laughs> I can't help. It's also the editors, because we need to convince them that good news also sell, because mm -hmm. that's, this is key in the process. They love to sell bad news. So the editor is a type of journalist. <laughs> a little bit more arrogant than the average. But, but um, <laughs> right? 
I'd like to add some things for this. Uh, I remember one time at, at the Follet São Paulo talking about it with uh, the journalists, but with uh, the editors. Uh, most of the media take science as a spectacle. Mm -hmm. for, for, for the big public, it's much important to do a photo of a, a new galaxy or a, a black hole than any other information. So science is uh, always in the media. It's, uh, you need to train the editors also because science most of the time are an spectacular for the public. And the images of uh, a new nebulosa, something this is sometimes much more important than other information. Great, great. It's more than invention, right? Um, thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists. It was a great pleasure to have you. It was a very insightful conversation. And uh, thank you, everyone who watched us via YouTube. Thank you all. And I hope this is one of a continuing collaboration between the Brazil Institute, FAPESP, and all the, the other institutions represented here in this panel. Thank you.